Thanks for staying with us. Time now for Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and this week, female genital mutilation has been banned in Senegal for more than 20 years, but many rural families continue to mutilate their daughters in secret. Campaigners say it's difficult to change traditional attitudes. Also, in Egypt, the town of Luxor feels more like a museum than the thriving tourist hotspot of past years. Following six months of shutdowns because of the pandemic, last month's reopening has seen visitors slow to return. And Ivory Coast's latest cinematic offering premieres to rave reviews. La Nuit des Rois, or Night of the Kings, is a modern take on the ancient tradition of storytelling set against the backdrop of a notorious prison. But first, Central African Republic is heading towards presidential and legislative polls in December, with about 620,000 refugees still out of the country. Many won't be able to vote because no arrangements were made to help them cast a ballot from afar. Even those who have made it back in time have found getting registered tough going. Our team reports. 250 refugees crossed the Obangi River from the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo to a minor port in Bangui, seven years after the, flat, the civil war in the Central African Republic. Thanks to a repatriation operation coordinated by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Fidel returns home. He hopes to cast his vote during the December 27 elections. However, these returnees are very late. The deadline for registrations has passed. We spoke to Boris, who was lucky enough to register. Oui, ça c'est ma fiche électeur. Donc tous les Centrafricains, en tant que bons citoyens, il fallait avoir une carte d'électeur. Age 37, he is among the two million Central Africans who will go to the polls. He returned to Central Africa last year. Since 2016, about 150,000 refugees have been repatriated. However, the number of returnees eligible to vote are between 250 and 300,000, according to Anisette Dologele, an unsuccessful 2015 presidential candidate. In March 2020, he launched a campaign for returnees to vote. Nous avons au niveau de l'Assemblée nationale interpellé le Premier ministre dès le mois de mars, mais on a senti une grande réticence. Le gouvernement n'a jamais voulu que ces réfugiés votent. On the other hand, Roland Bangui Betangai, member of parliament and chairman of the commission in charge of the electoral code, lays the blame on organizational issues. En aucun moment les organisateurs des élections ni le gouvernement est animé d'une mauvaise intention quelconque, mais ce sont les aspects techniques et l'expression surtout de la volonté du législateur centrafricain qui consiste à ne pas autoriser les réfugiés à voter. The refugee vote could exacerbate tensions in the Central African country as campaigning prepares to kick off. 620,000 Central African citizens still live outside the country. A prison drama that explores the power of narrative myth-making. La Nuit des Rois, or Night of the Kings, premiered to glowing reviews in the Ivorian city of Abidjan. Franco-Ivorian director Philippe Lecotte has already picked up several international awards for his second feature film, which is also Ivory Coast's entry to the Oscars. Thais Prouk and Sam Bradpiece went to check it out. La Maca is Ivory Coast's most notorious prison, and the setting for a new film which tells the story of a young man caught in a power struggle between prisoners vying to become inmate in chief. C'est lui. Notre Romain. Romain is the protagonist's nickname. In the film, he narrates a tale, holding his audience in distracted suspense to buy the prisoner's leader, who had fallen sick, a little more time in power. La Maca, c'est la seule prison au monde gouvernée par un détenu. Romain recounts the legend of Zama, who is a so-called microbe, the Ivorian term for a young delinquent. Most of the actors are newcomers to cinema. The film has already changed the life of Bakari Kone, the student who plays the main character. I had the chance to start with this project, the first role, the first film. So all is really beautiful and I really want to continue. On Thursday, the film premiered in Abidjan with the whole crew in attendance. Afterwards, the audience seemed convinced. The film is really beautiful. 
avec de belles images, de beaux sons. Vraiment, ça montre une autre image du cinéma ivoirien. C'est un film pertinent pour nous qui décrit les réalités ivoiriennes parce qu'en Côte d'Ivoire, il y a le phénomène des microbes et le film est très réaliste. The film is also a social commentary, the power struggle reflecting Ivory Coast's recent history. Quand on travaille sur les métaphores et quand on travaille sur des éléments d'archives comme je fais, ben, il y a des coïncidences comme ça avec la vraie histoire. Et c'est vrai que le film sort aujourd'hui juste après les élections et donc on a tendance à faire des, on a tendance à faire des, des raccourcis ou des, enfin, des, des projections. Et c'est bien aussi, on a le droit aussi de faire ces projections, elles ne sont pas fausses. The film will be released to the general public in Ivory Coast on December 4th before being shown around the world. Now, despite female genital mutilation technically being banned in Senegal for more than 20 years now, an estimated one in 10 girls is still a victim of the practice. It's in decline in cities, but not so much in rural communities. Our correspondents report from Tambakunda in the southeast. 17-year-old Ma Awa lives near Tambakunda, 500 kilometers east of Dakar. Like many girls in this rural area, it was her own family that subjected her to female genital mutilation in the name of tradition. In Tambakunda, people are starting to speak out against the practice. This afternoon, social workers have planned group discussions with the population, their number one priority, the scars of FGM. But their arguments are met with scepticism. La plupart des filles qui ont des règles douleurs, elles sont à 100%, elles sont, elles sont excisées. Donc moi je lis ça, n'est-ce pas, aux, aux effets de, 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 de l'excision, alors qu'elles elles soutiennent le contraire. Affaire du héros de l'insa, il n'y a pas de problème. 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 Il n'y a pas Efforts to change mentalities about FGM have brought few results in Senegal. According to the National Statistics Agency, almost a third of the population in rural areas support the practice, nearly 10% in cities. In Dakar, this activist is sounding the alarm. La réalité, ça ne diminue pas, comme on l'a dit, ça, ça augmente et c'est ça qui nous inquiète nous le plus. Les, les populations, euh, je ne sais pas, à cause de la situation de, de la pauvreté euh, et de du respect des normes sociales, continue vraiment à développer ces pratiques-là. Female genital mutilation is punishable by five years in prison. Yet very few arrests have been made in Senegal, according to the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Around 400,000 people have been displaced from South Sudan's Warup state since floods devastated the area in July. There are just some of the estimated 1 million forced from their homes nationwide by the extreme rains. Nicolas Chemin has more. It's a humanitarian disaster in Warup state in South Sudan. The worst rains in living memory and ethnic violence have displaced 377,000 people since July. The country's vice president Rebecca Nyandeng de Mabio visited Warap State, but she had little good news to offer the displaced people here. We were relying on oil, and now with the coronavirus internationally, oil has gone to zero. So South Sudan does, does not have any other revenues. Earlier this month, the United Nations said more than 1,000 people have been killed since May in Warap State. The UN said the violence between rival communities is often caused by cattle raiding, which kicks off a cycle of brutal revenge killings. Analysts are concerned that the communal violence could derail a peace agreement signed two years ago to end the civil war that killed nearly 400,000 people. 
once a thriving tourist city, Luxor in Egypt, now feels more like a museum. Despite attractions having reopened last month, tourists are slow to return following the six-month coronavirus shutdown. Communities are finding it hard to get by. The final checks before takeoff. A dawn flight over the Valley of the Kings offers dream views of ancient, eternal Egypt and is popular with tourists. But this morning, only a few passengers have taken their seats. Yeah, actually, we are quite lucky uh, that it's less crowded, uh, but it's not good for our country as well. One person's happiness is another's misfortune. The captain, Kareem, is nostalgic about a time not so long ago. Same time, last year it was our 35 balloon flying same time. A lot of companies stop now, no more. Because most of people, they afraid to come from Corona and also no more money to come uh, to fly. Everything is expensive. At this time of year, the centre of Luxor city is usually swarming with tourists. The bazaars are lively and the motorboats chug back and forward ceaselessly between the two banks of this ancient city. But for several months now, Mahmoud has had to leave his Dahabia, a kind of pleasure boat, moored by the quayside. In this city centre bar, Allah is adjusting to his new life. For 27 years, he accompanied tourists down the Nile from Luxor to Aswan. Now, he works 16 hours a day, six days a week, to feed his family. In a country where tourism accounts for 12% of GDP, if the health crisis lasts much longer, the pressures could prompt a social crisis too. Well, that's it for Across Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Till then, take care.